Welcome to Action Coaches Business Spotlight Series. I'm Rich Wainwright, business coach, trainer, and speaker, and I'm really pleased to be shining a light today on Stuart Easton from Transparent Choice. Welcome to the series, Stuart. Thanks, Rich. Good to meet you. Well, to get us going, please could you tell us a little bit about your business? Sure. So Transparent Choice is a software company. We're based here in Cambridge. And we do decision-making software. So you know, most customers use us to help prioritize uh, their strategic investments in projects, strategic initiatives, whatever it may be. Um, customers tend to be big corporates and uh, government agencies like the U.S. House of Representatives uses our software, uh, global banks, um, you know, top insurance companies, big manufacturing companies, um, that, that, that kind of thing. And um, what we do is we help them translate their strategy into action. Right? So they're, they're, they're making far better, far more focused use of resources, putting them on, on the things that will really move the needle instead of pet projects and things like that. Oh, fantastic. And, and how long has your business been going? So we've been going for just about 10 years. And um, uh, it's really only the last three or, three or so years that we've really taken off. And uh, I dare say we'll be talking about some of the missteps on the way uh, as, we, <laughs> as we go through this session. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so really it's, it's taken off in the last sort of three, three and a half years. And is, is growing very, very strongly. We grew about 90% last year, despite all the economic headwinds and everything else. Oh, fantastic. And, and what was it you were doing before? What got you into this? Is there a, a connection between previous life and this business? Yeah, so I've been around software and building software businesses for 30-something years. And um, during that time, I'd, I've done a number of gigs that were all about decision-making and reporting and analytics and that kind of good stuff. And one of the things that always bothered, bothered me was, you know, why, why is it we give, the, we give lead, leaders amazing data, yeah. great analysis, right? and then they make stupid decisions? Right? <laughs> how, how, how does that happen? Right? And um, uh, a, a guy I did my MBA with introduced me to my co-founders. And uh, one, one of them taught decision-making at the University of Poznan in Poland. And he, he told me the answer. Hmm. Right? And, and the answer is really simple. The reason they make really stupid decisions is because they're human. Hmm. And so, you know, we've got all these biases and everything else that we all carry around. And uh, so, there's, so it turns out there's loads of research into how to fix that, right? yeah. how to help how to offset some of those, those biases, how to dampen down the biases. You can't eliminate them. Sure. Um, and how to, again, dampen down some of the noise, because, again, you can't eliminate it. Um, and then how to combine subjective input into a decision with objective data. And, right. and it turns out there's a little bit of an art to that and, and sort of methodology. So we've, we've, basically what we've done is we've wrapped up all of those methodologies um, into, or a bunch of those methodologies, into software so you know it's, it's a little bit like um you know when you bake a cake yeah right? you follow a recipe and you get a cake you don't need to know about you know cross-linking proteins and egg white sure. to to bake a cake you just follow the recipe and we've, we've kind of done that we've taken all the decision science and mm -hmm. and turned it into a, a recipe and you you know you just follow the recipe you'll get a cake um so you don't need to be, be a decision scientist or a data scientist or any of those things to get good decisions Ah, well, I was going to ask you about your secret sauce. We're uh, right into the metaphors, the baking. There it is. Right there. there it is. So I, I hear you You said uh, founders, fellow founders. Um, so obviously starting the business, what's your role within the business currently? So so I'm I'm the CEO and I, I basically own uh, uh, the, all, all the corporate governance stuff, obviously, you know, strategy and direction, and then, uh, then primarily hands-on in the commercial side. So growing the business, finding customers, making sure they're happy, all that kind of good stuff. And, uh, and then just kind of overseeing the, the product development from a, or from a government's point of view than anything else. Hmm. Okay. So back to that secret source then. So what, what would you say, it is that uni business are really good at and how that maybe stand out from other businesses that if there are many that are in your field. So the, the, the real secret is combining that, that decision science, which is all a little bit esoteric and ivory tower academic, right? 
and, and we're recording this in Cambridge, right? Home of the <laughs> Ivory Tower Academic, you could say. And, um, uh, and so the real secret sauce is that we've taken that and we've layered in a, a really healthy dose of collaboration in the software, because collaboration is always good in decisions as long as it's done right. Um, and, and then we've worked really hard to make it easy. Um, and you know you're making you're making difficult, complex decisions in large organizations. So it's not, you know, it's not like flicking a switch and it just works. But it's a heck of a lot easier than than some of the other tools out there. So you know there are some tools based out of the US that do similar things. And you know where we've won customers from them, the 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 first thing that that people always say to us is, "Gosh, how did you make that so easy?" Yeah, because um, uh, they're just used to it being really complex and difficult. Hmm. I've, I've um, often simplified business ownership down to it being just around problem solving. Uh, you start a business to solve someone's problem, and then you spend some time solving your team's problem and solving their problems. <laughs> and, and I think the key is solving the problem that the customer has, not the problem you think the customer has. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, I mean, it, it's you know, the, the journey to get to where we are today. You know, we, we kind of picked our mountain and we, we set mm-hmm. off to go and climb it. And we spent five years just hacking through weeds and brambles and finding streams we couldn't get across and all kinds of things. And then suddenly we sort of took another quick look at what the customers were saying to us. Yeah. And realized there was another path up the same mountain, just from yeah. the other side. Uh-huh. And, and as soon as we got on that path, poof, off we went. So, you know, it's, it's, it's about listening and just solving the problem in the customer's language, the way the customer thinks about it, and that will get you to the top of the mountain. Hmm. There's a, a great quote by, um, oh, Craig, one of the, one of the great uh, legacy salespeople, um, and I remember his audio, he's got a, it, from one of the southern states in America, I won't try and, and imitate it, but he said, I heard everything he was saying, but not one thing he said. <laughs> Absolutely. And that, that uh, stuck with me. I think, if I remember rightly, I was driving from pra- Prague to a client's wedding um, at the other side of Czech. And I, I will always remember the, that saying and, and where I was when it happened. So, um, so talking about you know, metaphorical mountain streams, brambles and such. What are some of the biggest challenges that you've overcome over the years? So I think the, 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 the first and the biggest was just actually learning enough about the customer. Hmm. So we, we had the technology. We had to learn about the customer. We had to learn what the problems really were, what language they used, um, you know, where they hung out, all that kind of good stuff. Uh, yeah. I think that was the, the first, the first big one, um, and then the second big learning I think that, that was quite transformative for us was um, was when we just took the gloves off and said, uh, "We are going to go and win the SEO battle, the search engine optimization battle." So we're going to we're going to rank one, two, three on Google for the yeah. thing that we really care about, and. Um, and when we did that, and we really put a lot of effort into it, when we did that, that just, again, transformed everything. Mm. Because suddenly people were typing into Google the, the, the term that we had learned was a code word for they need help, yep. right? So it was a self-selecting group of people that were finding us. Yep. And we knew that when they did that, that, that they had the kind of pain that we could solve. And so that was really for us the, the shortcut that, that got us on, got us onto the path. Mm. Um, uh, you know, that path up the hill uh, was was really nailing what those, you know, what the right terms are that you need to win, and then getting out and winning them. Mm, brilliant. And sort of the flip side of that sometimes some of our biggest wins can be when we overcome uh, a particularly big challenge. But what have been some of your biggest wins along the way? Um, I think, I think uh, obviously, first revenue, that's always a big win. Uh, and that was, that was great. Um, and then I think that the, the next really big win was when we got our first major corporate customer. Yeah. Um, because that was validation that we'd been listening and we were building something that was adding value to them. 
um, and enough value to overcome the organizational momentum that they had, the inertia to do nothing. Right? Um, and that, that was a great moment. Um, the other great, great moments were just kind of little bits of serendipity here and there where, you know, we, we, we had one customer who said, hey, I, I'd really like a form to do this thing. Hmm. And then over the weekend, you know, one of my, one of my co-founders just thought, well, if we did that, why don't we just, you know, if we're going to do that, we might as well just do this thing as well. Hmm. And, and, you know, and, and so it was just, it was just, you know, lazy Saturday afternoon. He, he thought, I'll, I'll build something. And come the Monday, I showed it to a prospect. And he went, that's brilliant. Right? So, the, <laughs> so there was no planning. There was no grand yeah. vision. It was just pure luck that he had that idea. He had a Saturday afternoon spare and he did something. Right? Mm. And again, that, that really helped add value to the product. So sometimes you get lucky. You know, those are some of the big well, Look, my favorite definition is when opportunity meets preparation. There you, you go. Led there by you listening, go. you listened, there's an opportunity. Well, so so here's here's a nice little coincidence for you. So sometimes luck really is luck. Yeah. And um, so the the first organization that paid us money for the software was the University of Indiana. Okay. And they were using it to do some work with the local government out there. And um, and pure luck. Um, I was looking at our accounts one day, and I realized that we just ticked over the million, our first million dollars of, of sales. Yeah. And I thought, well, I wonder, I wonder who it was that pushed us over the top. It was the same customer. Okay. So our very first customer was the one by sheer chance who pushed us over the million dollar mark. So it was one of those beautiful poetic moments where you, <laughs> where you just, you know, brings a tear to your eye and you think, wow, what a journey we're on. Right? Brilliant. I, I've, <laughs> When I share this with people outside of uh, outside the coaching industry, um, I sometimes I, I my clients struggle to celebrate their wins. Um, famously, one of my clients, um, if he didn't celebrate, I would go out and celebrate and send him the invoice, and that was <laughs> the only way I could get him to because they were having win after win after win. You know, beating month. You know, every month was a, a record month. Things like that. He almost got a bit tired of celebrating. Uh, and I have to sometimes have to remind them, and, and in this case, force them to celebrate. What are some of the? Are, are you a celebrator? Do you reward yourself in a way for these wins? What What are some of the, the things that? It's uh... great, great. So, so one of the things that we we did that just sort of happened. We didn't plan it this way, but um, but now it's started. We we're kind of embracing it. Is that we we built the organization completely virtually. Hmm. So you know we've got people. We're, we're eleven people. And we've got, you know, we've got uh, four or five in the UK scattered all over the place. We've got three in Poland, one in the Czech Republic, two in South Africa, one in India. So, I mean, they're all over the place. Yeah. And you can do that with modern technology, but it makes the celebration difficult. So, um, so you know, we, we, we do celebrate, not, not, not too often because people do get celebrated. It becomes, oh, yeah, right, okay. Right, you, so, so not, too, not too often, but... But every so often, we'll just we'll we'll, we'll kind of deliberately do a, a little bit of a retrospective. Yeah. So it's not necessarily celebrating at the time always, yeah. but just saying, "Hey guys, look at this deal that we just closed." And so we did this about six months ago. So look at this deal that we just closed. None of us even we, we didn't even register it. Yeah. Right? It was just a mid, just a normal run of the mill deal. Yeah. Let me put that into perspective. 18 months ago, that would have been our biggest deal ever. Context. Wow. The context matters, yeah. right? And so, so we all kind of thought about that for a while and we, we, you know, we got all, all happy and, you know, that was, that was good. Um, so, so I, you know, I think you can overdo it, um, but, but I think it really is important to keep people... Um, it, you know, if you're achieving goals, if you're achieving stuff, it's easy to stay motivated. Mm -hmm. right? And sometimes we just forget that we are achieving incredible things. You know, if you're building a if you're building a startup, you are doing something unbelievable, right? Through sheer effort, you are yeah. creating something that didn't exist before. And it's hard. It's hard work. Yeah. So, yeah. Can be. But, no, that's fantastic. 
Um, learnings wise, if you're going to, to look back and say some of the biggest learnings and perhaps maybe a surprising learning, perhaps that uh, you wouldn't have expected and with hindsight went, oh, wow. <laughs> um, I, I, think, I think one of the big learnings is, and, and actually it's not from this startup, it's from a previous startup, Mm. Uh, that I've applied in this one, and it's uh, that's been very helpful. Is um, right from the very beginning, think about the team. Yeah. Right? Think about what kind of people you want to work with. Yeah. What kind of culture? And uh, don't go over the top, right? Don't, don't you know? You don't need to go and get a culture consultant and really you know start nailing it down. But just think about you know, do we want to be um, you know crazy mad t-shirt wearing? beer drinking, West Coast teenagers doing their startup. Do we want to be IBM, mm -hmm. right? Do we want to be all corporate or do we want to be something else? Yeah. Um, and, um, and then making sure that the, the founding team in particular, um, uh, and, and in my view, if possible, you should always make it a team, not a founder, but a founding team. But, but the founding team in particular, um, I think the, the big, big learning is you need to make sure that those people have similar goals. Yeah. So, the, so when I met the guys, the very first question I asked was, what does success look like? I don't care what it is we build. What does success look like? Question number. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Well, and, and the key thing in that case was the answer wasn't a number, right? Yeah. The, the answer was we, we changed the world somehow. And, um, and uh, so, so that's, that's kind of a big one. Yeah. And, then, and then I think just uh, one of the, the, the recent learnings that I had, which is really powerful is that, you know, I studied, we, we were laughing in the green room, right? So I studied physics a million years ago um, in the other place in Oxford, not in well, Cambridge. Awesome. Uh, steady. And, um, uh, and so, you know, I, I tend to have a little bit of that scientific stem arrogance right that, that if you're not deep analytic and you're not you know yep. a numbers guy then you don't really do anything you just write poetry all day yeah <laughs> and um and we recently hired a, a guy into our engineering team whose degree was in music and who still plays a very creative guy and he's, and he's knocking it out of the park. And uh, so one of the things that we do to keep the team together is every Friday, we have someone just take 20 minutes to talk about something, yeah. anything, and then tell us why that's relevant to the business. So he did creativity and how that, that background of his, that is the opposite of that quant background that I value, right? right? how that background helps him solve problems and be creative and, you know, and he's knocking it out of the park. And it was, it was fantastic. Nobody's ever been able to convince me of that before, but now I'm a, I'm a believer. I'm a believer. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> we're, we're breaking into song now, are we? Um, but they are the wrong side of the Pennines, however. Yeah, they are, yeah. One last one as we look back before we move into looking forward. So if you could start again today, what would you do differently? Um, what we got? I suppose there's an answer to that one, but maybe um, a couple of biggies. Yeah, I, I, think, I, think the, I think the first one is, you know, we, we definitely did fall into the trap of trying to build what we thought the world needed yeah. instead of listening and building what the world needed. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's not even, it's what the world thinks they need. Yeah. And, um, you know, so, so I think the, 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 that, that if I could do it again, I'd have spent a lot more time up front yeah. learning about the target customers and what they need and what the language is and all those things. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that's, that's, that's the biggest one is just make sure you really know your market. Mm, it falls, that sort of reflects a little bit of a, a conversation I had with a, a, a friend from India who is a, a, a generic difference in, in Britain you get good at something then spend your life trying to find someone to buy it instead in India we we look and find something that everybody wants and work out how how we're going to do that and you know completely looking at it from the other end that's more market-led more product-led so yeah that's a really interesting and, and and 
And you know what? If if we didn't have people who uh, were who had that sort of product vision, we wouldn't have iPhones. We wouldn't have wouldn't have a Model T Ford. Mm-hmm. Right? Uh, nobody was asking for those things uh, yeah. done that way. Uh, but what they did was they understood what the need was. Right. So Henry Ford understood that affordable transportation was a need. Yeah. Right. And he figured out what the answer was. Yeah. And so you know, with us, I think we we understood ultimately what the need was. But we we didn't do a good job of understanding what the path was to delivering that need. So the need we're servicing today is the need that we sketched out on a napkin in Starbucks the first day we met. Yeah. Right. Um, but we're doing it in a very different way, in a way that uh, and it's the same tools, it's the same technology fundamentally, but just the language and the the the, the way of talking about it is is fundamentally different. It's in in the customer's language, not in our language. Basic stuff, really. Well, it, it seems basic, but I think for a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of startups, uh, a lot of people whose business have been maybe not stagnating, that seems a harsh word, but not really moving at the pace they want to move, that, that's a, you know, it's, a, it's a lesson for everyone. And, and I think they, you know, along with that is, is sort of an understanding of where, you know, I, I liken um, finding customers to, you know, you're looking for animals out in the, in the world, yeah, you know, in the out in the veld. Right? Yeah. So you can out, you can go out into the into the veld, and you can go and look for animals, or you can go and sit by the watering hole and wait for the animals to come. Yeah. Right? And and you know, I, I think it's important to understand not just what language they are, but where are the watering holes? How you know when they're at the watering hole, what is it that you can do to attract them into your sphere of influence and all that kind of good stuff so it's not you know it's not as simple as just okay there's a problem and we're going to build a product to fix it the product includes how do you reach the customer yeah the product includes how do you talk to the customer the product includes how do you support and deliver them the the, the service or the product that you've that you've got um so the you know the product is some it's, it's the partnerships you build it's the it's all of that stuff you know it's all the jeffrey moore stuff from from the the late eighties, early nineties, whenever that was, um, uh, you know, crossing the chasm type stuff, yeah. building a, a total solution. Mm, no, I, I, again, I, I, I'm really enjoying this. This is, I think, you know, we should have been doing these videos years ago. I think <laughs> <laughs> there's so much to be learned and so much to be gained from them. So thank you for sharing all that stuff. Looking backwards, let's have a look forwards now. Um, so what are some of the opportunities or perhaps some of the challenges you're seeing uh, coming up and um, what do you think you need to get around and, and through a few of those? Well, the, I think the biggest challenge for, for many people is just uh, you know, the macro, macroeconomic situation right now. Okay. So we're recording this in January 2023. Um, you know, we've, we've got war, we've got high, you know, big inflation, we've got in political instability, we've got all kinds of things. And for us, that you know, second half of last year, that translated into a, a significant slowdown. Customers mm-hmm. delaying, postponing, putting off, cancelling um, uh, initiatives. Yeah. And um, you know, so, so our, our key challenge is to make sure we don't get ahead of ourselves. Yeah. So we, we've actually put together quite a conservative plan for this year in, in terms of growth, um, basically to make sure that we um, that we are able to continue growing, but not run out of cash, run out of energy, uh, and have to go fundraising or anything like that. Yeah. So it's it's just it's just being aware of it, and then making sure that you you just stay focused on solving the customer problems. And so we've got some product that's coming out um, coming out in beta this quarter, hopefully, that's going to transform. You know, it's it's going to help people. You know, think about that mountain that you're climbing. You know, that's going to get us from from base camp to 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 uh, camp three in in one step. Right? You know, it's that kind of quantum change in the in the product. So, you know, product and innovation. When 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 times are difficult, you know, the companies that continue to invest and continue to innovate are the ones that not only make progress during downtime, but then they emerge much stronger as the economy picks up. So, so it's a question of you know, finding that balance between pulling your horns in a bit so that you survive, make sure you survive, but continuing to innovate and make sure that you're adding value. Yeah, yeah. I wonder how many business owners have, uh, have a lot more experience in that over the last few years than, than ever before. 
Um, the word pivot was probably used more in 2020 than it has been for uh, for many a recession. <laughs> well, and, and it's not just the startups. You know, the big guys are, you know, they've all hired too many people, got far ahead of where they actually are because they, they sort of assumed the good times would just keep rolling. Yeah. And, um, you know, again, in the green room, we were talking about this. There's, there's a little bit of this a culture around startups in particular that says, hey, let's go raise $30 million. And so what do you do when you raise $30 million? Right? To, to, you've got to understand how VCs work. So VCs, they raise a chunk of money. They raise a billion dollars in a fund. That fund has a 10-year life. So they've got to be exiting at the end of 10 years. That means they have to deploy that billion dollars in yeah. the first five years of the fund. Yeah. So they want to give you $30, $40 million. And then they want to give you another $30, $40 million six months later and another $30, $40 million six months after that. Because that's yeah. the only way you can deploy that much cash. And so it, th this drives this really weird behavior of going out, hiring people, spending money, and not doing it carefully. Yeah. And um, you know, I, I, I remember I met a CEO of, lightbulb.com, I think it was, or something like that, just after the first dot-com crash, right, 2000, 2000 2001, somewhere around there. Yeah. And um, he, he told this brilliant story about how they raised, you know, they raised 10 million bucks at the time. That was a lot of money. And, and he, he said, yeah, and we spent two years, and we spent $9 million, and we had no progress to show for it. And with the last million dollars, that last million dollars, we knew we had to deliver everything with a million dollars. So we really focused and we really concentrated on the things that added value. And in the, with that last million dollars, yeah. we built the business and sold it for a gazillion whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I forget what they sold it for, but it was a, a significant return. So they didn't need ten million dollars, and that ten million, you know, having too much cash, actually made them kind of lazy and mm -hmm. unfocused. Right? So. Mm -hmm. Um, I get to see that in the economic cycles when things are lean in the economy, people are lean with their business and then they come out, things fatten up and sometimes get too fat. And then when the, uh, the economy shrinks again, that's when they struggle. But these people have kept it lean and mean. They're the ones who are, are still there uh, growing despite the, the change in circumstances for the bigger businesses. Exactly that. Exactly that. So, yeah, you know, this year is another, you know, hopefully another year of growth. Yeah, but, but being cautious, but continuing to innovate. Fantastic. So <laughs> you just got down to my question here about what, what constitutes success for you. I think you've probably answered that. I think that would, would you like to add any more to, to what you shared earlier? Yeah, do, do you know what? Um, money is this funny thing that, you know, once you've got enough, does it really matter how much you've got? So money isn't the measure of success. It's, it's what impact have you had on the world? Yeah. And, and, you know, so, yeah, somebody like Steve Jobs was really, really wealthy, mm. but the, his, his, his wealth isn't the lasting impact. The lasting impact is, is the change that he, he brought about. So yeah. for me, success is that we, we build a business that actually fundamentally changes the way certain things happen in, in large organizations that makes them, that means that society benefits you know those organizations are more efficient they deliver better products and services whether it's government or business yeah. and and we all benefit from that so that's that's the measure of success i love it i was just thinking uh, i didn't want to take this back to the green room um but um you talked about people who have got all this fantastic and brilliant data but then make stupid decisions uh, do you have a, a division within your business for politicians uh, um uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> so we'll put that on the cutting room floor <laughs> yeah I, th I, th I think that one can uh, go to the green room and uh, when we're not recording i'll tell you some stories <laughs> love it so final question for you uh, or penultimate question what would you say to anyone who's thinking about starting or buying into uh, a business um, actually, I, th I think the first question and, and the most important question of all is the question that we just talked about. Mm -hmm. Why? What is success to you? Mm. And uh, once and, and be honest about it. 
Yeah. Right. So for some people, it will be money. Right. And that's okay. That's, 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 that's them. Right. Um, for other people, it'll be about social impact uh, or creating employment locally or helping the environment or whatever it may be. So I would say the, 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 the first thing is just make sure you really understand what your personal goal is for doing it. And then, and then make sure that you've got some kind of path with that business of achieving that goal. Um, and, and, and if it's something that you have some form of passion about, yeah. that really helps. It really does. That really helps. <laughs> of course, of course. Well, thank you, Stuart. That has been fantastic. Um, I've really enjoyed it. I'm sure our, our viewers will too. In terms of how our viewers might be wanting to get in touch with you, there may be potential customers out there, potential suppliers, potential uh, team members, investors even. Um, happy for us to put your details alongside this for them to get in touch. Uh, ab absolutely. And, um, you know, we're, we're always looking for new customers. So anyone that, that's, you know, working on corporate strategy or who's running a portfolio of projects, give me a shout. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll, I'd love to hear from you. Um, same thing with investors and, and particularly any really smart people who want to make a difference. Yeah. Um, let me know. Just reach out on LinkedIn, LinkedIn or, you know, hopefully you'll stick my contact details on Absolutely. and people can reach out direct. Brilliant. Well, with that, Stuart, on behalf of the viewers, on behalf of Action Coach, on behalf of me, myself, uh, well, and, and, and to be fair, Rich, given that you and I grew up about five miles apart, <laughs> on behalf of the whole of West Yorkshire. On behalf of the whole of West Yorkshire. <laughs> that is a token of coincidences, of course, yeah. Um, it was nice to uh, to pick up the phone and someone say, where's that accent from? Yeah. Uh, from four or five miles away where we grew up together. So, it, yeah. Fantastic. Good stuff. Well, so thank you for inviting me along. Well, as actually <laughs> Uh, and our viewers thank you and I wish you all the very best for the future thank you very much and thanks for the time today Pleasure.